Indian Studies, Jaipur will not be able to join us today. The other panelists are Muhammad Moz, uh, Professor Mohammad Mozam Ali Mustarib, Professor and former HOD Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad, and Dr. Bhim Subba, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad. After, we, after this, we will have a small uh, half an hour for uh, question and answer round, and we end with the vote of thanks. I now invite Evangeline Longclaw, PhD scholar at the Department of English, to walk us through the inception of Association of Indian Research Scholars. Over to you, Evangeline. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. All right. Okay. Uh, the Association of Indian Research Scholars, also known as AIRS, is the brainchild of Ariba Espinas, the president of this association. It was created to bring together like-minded, intellectually inclined, and enthusiastic research scholars of our generation, and to collectively increase our knowledge base, while also interacting with the best minds in the world. To this end, we have garnered the support of some of the best in their field, including Professor Mohammed Mazam Ali, Professor and former HOD, Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad, Professor Zoya Hassan, Professor Emerita, Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Professor Alfredo Toro Hadi, retired Venezuelan diplomat, scholar, professor, and public intellectual, Dr. Aparna Devare, Assistant Professor at the University of Hyderabad, Professor Rajan Harshe, Professor of Political Science and the former Vice Chancellor of Allahabad Central University, and many scholars from across the world, including Nuno Rodriguez, Director Quixote Global from Madrid, Spain, Paul Simonsky from Space Strategy Center, Carnegie Mellon University, New Mexico, USA. The aim of an association like AIRS is to not only provide a platform for young scholars to connect with experts, but also to have intellectually stimulating and interactive sessions with them. In order to make this happen, we aim to hold webinars, e-lectures, seminars, talks, book discussions, and distinguished lectures. In the future, we also intend to expand towards doing conferences, seminars, symposiums, and book discussion panels. Through these mediums, AIRS intends to promote a seamless and harmonious interaction and engagement between the social sciences and humanities community in the country. It also aspires to bring together people to hold discussions, debates, and conversations on theory, research methodology, research ethics, research practices, and methods to expand the research community and to bring everyone within one ambit. The future of AIRS holds dynamic experiences. We intend to bring the Indian community closer to the international community, not only through lectures and seminars, but also through publication. AIRS intends to focus on the most relevant issues in the world and the various pressing scenarios on the national and international scene. Following AIRS will help you stay on the top of not only current affairs and get an in-depth analysis of burning topics, but it will also give you the opportunity to expand your knowledge base through the diversity of our events. We now also have publication opportunities with Millennium Journal of Humanities and Social Sciences. You can submit your paper to the official mail, which is Ariba Mozam at Air Scholars on Microsoft.com. The mail will be on our chat box for accuracy. You can follow Airs on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Telegram. You can also follow our site, airs.org.in. Thank you, and over to you, Ariba. Thank you, Yuan, for summarizing that for us. I now invite Zeba Tamkanath, Vice President of AS, to introduce our eminent speaker for the day. Over to you, Zeba. Thank you so much, Ariba. Um, good evening, everybody. I will be uh, introducing Professor Alfredo Toro Hardy today. Professor Alfredo Toro Hardy is a Venezuelan retired diplomat, scholar, and author. He has a PhD on international relations and several masters and postgraduate degrees, including a master and law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Before retiring from the Venezuelan Foreign Service, 
He served as ambassador to the United States, the United Kingdom, Spain, Brazil, Singapore, Chile, and Ireland. He directed the diplomas, diplomatic academy of his country, as well as other Venezuelan academic institutions, while being visiting professor at the uni universities of Princeton, Barcelona, and Brasilia. He has been a Fulbright scholar, academic advisor of the University of Westminster, and a two-time Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center research yeah. resident scholar. Author of 20 books and co-author of 15 more, he has also published 30 peer-reviewed papers, all of them on international affairs. Thank you. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Zeba, for that lucid introduction about the speaker. I now invite Ambassador Alfredo Toro Hardy to share with us some of the major arguments from his book. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Very honored to be participating in this event organized by the Association of Indian Research Scholars. And uh, I would like to speak about my recently published book, China versus the US, Who Will Prevail? The book aims at answering two main questions. Did China challenge the United States too hard and too soon, and by doing so seriously affect the chance to attain its objectives? And can Washington still contain China's ascendancy and retain its current leading status? Few countries, have made such a systematic and conscious effort to project a constructive international image as China did during the first years of the new millennium. From the conceptualization and promotion of the concept of peaceful rise to the foundation and dissemination of the Confucian East Confucius institutes around the world to the launching of CCTV in English, few nations did indeed associate the foreign policy to soft power in such an efficient and deliberate manner. From 2008 onward, though, the tone began to change in a significant manner as China's geopolitical stance became much more assertive. This muscular approach to foreign policy clearly intensified after Xi Jinping's arrival to power in 2013. Converging strategies like those represented by the China dream of national rejuvenation or made in China 2025 reflect such aim. The first purses a powerful and prosperous China, the expansion of the country's geopolitical footprint, a focus on increased military power and a military technology and the change of China's strategic geography. The second on its part, aims at transforming China into a world leader in science, technology, and innovation by the mid-21st century. Earlier, in 2017, China published its first ever white paper on China's policies on Asia-Pacific cooperation, in which it made clear its intention of establishing itself as the dominant power in Asia. The maps of the region that the Chinese now print show 90% of the South China Sea as theirs. China has undertaken an artificial island building spree in the South China Sea, while subsequently transforming those islands into fortresses onto the teeth. It's a certainness. In, research, in relation to its territorial disputes with India have increased as well as has its drive towards an Indian Ocean Blue Water Navy presence. Since 2014, China launched more submarines, warships and other vessels 
than the total number of ships currently in serving in the combined navies of Germany, India, the UK, and Taiwan. The country is engaged in the most active ballistic and cruise missile program in the world. Uh, in 2017, the People's uh, Liberation Army uh, opened its Djibouti, Djibouti's base in the Horn of Africa, and so on. By heralding the country's ambitions and boasting about its capabilities, while at the same time hardening its geopolitical and military stance, China has unavoidable ch challenge the United States primacy. This has generated a strong reaction from that country, where a widespread consensus now pictures China in antagonistic terms. As a result, instead of sailing with the winds at its back, as used to be the case, China is now sailing against very powerful winds. However, for a country as obsessed as China is in continuously measuring its comprehensive national power, it would seem to be out of place to have provoked America's reaction if they have felt unprepared for a measurement of forces. China's assertiveness may simply mean uh, that uh, according to its own calculations, the country is now powerful enough to take the stand. Waging the national power, the, the, the national power of both countries, it's then the best way to ascertain if indeed it was too soon for China or if on the contrary, it's, it is already too late for the US to respond to the challenge. In order to wage the power profile of both China and the US, my book tries to ascertain how well they rank in six different aptitude categories. These are the following. The convergence aptitude, the strategic aptitude, the universality aptitude, the military aptitude, the economic aptitude, and the technological aptitude. Let's explain them. First, the convergence aptitude. This refers to the capability shown by both countries to rally others behind them. In the final phase of World War II, or in its aftermath, the, a network of multilateral organizations and alliances began to take shape under the auspices of the United States. A sophisticated multilateral system was a structure under the stewardship of Washington. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the whole community of nations had to find a rearrangement under the American hegemony, which henceforward became global. As, Far as Farid Zakaria has argued, the US hegemony in the post-Cold War era was like nothing the world has seen since the time of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Inexplicably, under the light of common sense, <coughs> George W. Bush administrations arrived to government wanted to turn such a state of things upside down. In this manner, this administration began to disarticulate precisely at the moment when it had to reach its apex, a complex hegemonic structure that had taken decades to build. 
As a result, they proclaim the futility of multilateral cooperation, which in their eyes constrained the freedom of, of action to which American power was entitled. They said, I write, they said directly and brutally the prerogatives of the country's national interest. They made it clear that the overwhelming nature of uh, US power accepted it from compliance with international norms and rules. Fortunately for the US, the next tenant of the White House, Barack Obama, was ready to take a different direction. Obama seems to have followed Richard Hass's prescription on the nature of power, according to which uh, power as an end in itself is not very helpful. What really counts is the possibility of turning that power into influence. In other words, power is simple potentiality and the role of a successful foreign policy is to transform such potentiality into real influence. This became clear through initiatives, through the American participation in the Paris Agreement on Climate, on climate Change, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in relation to Iran, in the newly created G20, or in the OTAN summits, among other instances. Uh, this achievement, though, was seriously compromised with the arrival to power of Donald Trump, a president who was not only imbued with George W. Bush unilateralism, but that curiously combined it with what appears to be a pre-World War II isolationist approach to foreign policy. His administration practically abandoned all the initiatives undertaken by Obama under the banners of collective action and cooperative multilateralism. Trump has targeted Washington allies in all kinds of manners under the assumption that national sovereignty and national interest can be the only foundation of international relations. As a result, close allies such as Japan, South Korea, Canada, Mexico, or the European Union have all been affected. Even India, that plays such a fundamental geopolitical role, has been, uh, has been placed in a very difficult position where a transactional approach to foreign policy prevails over geopolitical consideration and where trade seems to be more important for the US than geopolitics. George W. Bush followed eight years later by Donald Trump is simply too much for the allies and friends of America to handle. Indeed, they have come to mistrust the country where their ideas have enjoyed of such a wide support. If a nation as close to the US as Germany uh, can no longer trust it, as uh, Angela Merkel uh, made it clear in Agri Strand in 2018, then who can trust the US? Where does China stand in terms of its convergence capacity? The answer is simple. China's unstoppable drive to a position of leadership in the expansion on globalization and the fact that it is the world's most interconnected country in terms of trade has simultaneously broadened its convergence capacity. The vital role played by China in a group of institutions and organizations such as the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, 
the Silk Road Fund, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the Free Trade Area of the Asia-Pacific, and very especially the Belt and Road Initiative, all play in favor of its aptitude to rally others in its back. China's nationalistic excesses have hampered to an important extent its convergence capacity. However, it is reasonable to assume that its leading role in globalization has been able to shield China to an important extent from such excesses. This is consistent with the concept of geoeconomics, according to which the use of economic instruments allowed to achieve geopolitical goals. Two, the geostrategic aptitude. This aptitude relates to the capability of sustaining a steady and consistent course of action within a clear roof map. As an established superpower, which, pay, which plays the geopolitical game in different scenarios <laughs> at the same time, the United States' risk of distraction and dispersions are high. Conversely, with a much more localized and closer to home geopolitical ambitions, plus a single mind sense of purpose, China is much better prepared to remain in focus. Moreover, during its confrontation with the Soviet Union, <laughs> the ideological contest provided a clear route map to do the United States. This new Cold War with China, in contrast, has as its underpinning factor, not ideology, but the capability shown by both countries to outmatch the other in terms of the results. This means simply that the main element of this new Cold War is efficiency. In this sense, the US is hampered by the fact that it's political system has become increasingly polarized and dysfunctional. Polarization has taken hold of the US political system, bringing down any possibility of international strategic consistency. In the past, the US was split vertically by its multiple divides. This was consistent with the anti-majoritarian nature of its political system as constructed by its founding fathers. Today, however, partisan identities, the two big partisan identities, have merged with such divide, generating two overwhelming majorities. These antagonistic majorities coexist side by side, demonizing each other. As a result, a dangerous horizontal split is detaching <clears throat> its political system and society as <coughs> into. Under those circumstances, zigzagging becomes unavoidable. China, on the other hand, has to find a clear route, a, a clear cut objective, becoming number one by 2049. This not only strengthens the nationalistic resolve of its population and unifies the country on the common banners, but provides a clear sense of direction. Quoting Kevin Roth, China is marching towards its perception of its global destiny. It has a strategy. The West 
has no end of the quote. Three, the universality attitude. This attitude relates to the capability of projecting globally its own culture and values. This attitude represents China's Achilles heel. True power and leadership for China would entail giving shape to a Sinocentric world. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that is completely, completely out of reach for China by the simple fact that uh, China has always been interested in developing a Chinese civilization, not a global one. Much to the contrary, the United States inherited the hegemonic torch from a country from which it also inherited language and civilization, the United Kingdom. As a result, during the last two centuries, the world has been dominated by Anglo-centric contents. Nothing similar to this has been seen in history. English is the closest thing to lingua franca in modern days, being the common language spoken in airports around the world, as well as the global language of business. The world's most influential media is based either in the US or the UK. And when aiming at global coverage, Chinese, Russian, or Qatari, Qatari media resort to the English language. The 10 highest ranking universities of the world are located in the US or the UK, and so on. From Shakespeare to the Gettysburg, the Gettysburg address, from McDonald's to Facebook, from Marvel Comics to Harry Potter, from jazz to rock, from Hollywood to Netflix, the symbols of universal interconnection have been and still remain very much Anglo-centric. Thousands of years of inward-looking self-satisfaction within a great world mentality impose a huge burden on China's possibilities of responding to this challenge, of giving shape to a Sinocentric world. Its civilization remains domestically encapsulated to a large extent, with only a few expressions of it having attained true universality. China's sophisticated and potent civilization still remains unintelligible for most of humanity, as does to its official language, the Mandarin. 500 Confucius Institute disseminated around the world are trying to address this limitation today. However, this is but a grain of sand in a gigantic beach. Four, the military aptitude. This aptitude relates to the capability of one of the parties to impose its will upon the other without going to war, or to defeat the other in a proper armed conflict. In, in 2030, China is expected to surpass the US GDP in absolute terms. While it did it, well, it surpassed it already in parity per gate for chasing terms in 2014. As a result, China, will be more and more on the winning side of the military budgetary competition. By 2050, China's economy will be much larger, larger than America's, perhaps three times larger, according to some estimates. 
as a result, China will be able to outspend U.S. military budgets at will. However, while this moment arrives, China is circumventing the U.S. military superiority by unconventional ways. Let me explain. During the Cold War, the United States was able to offset the Soviet Union advantage in four size by maintaining a technological edge. <clears throat> Washington refused to pay the economic penalty of matching Moscow man for man or tank for tank. Instead, it came at confronted at confronting Soviet numerical superiority with a smaller but technologically superior army. In little more than two decades, the Chinese military have accomplished technological achievements that risk beating the US in its own game. Although it never called it in that way, China decided to develop its own offset strategy. One that aims at overcoming the American technological advantages and superior military budget. The main element of China's offset strategy has been based in becoming an asymmetric military superpower outside of the realm of conventional military power. Asymmetric weapons aim at destroying or render useless America's sophisticated equipment and systems with weapons priced at just a fraction of the cost. It is the equivalent to the disruptive innovation that startups like Netflix, Uber, or Airbnb used to upset you have used to upset previous dominant firms. Chinese military indeed is developing new technologies able to counter U.S. military superiority by a fraction of its cost. In terms of nuclear weapons on its part, <coughs> the U.S. enjoys of clear superiority. However, yet again, China might be able to impose clear limits to that superiority. Two categories of nuclear weapons are here in both strategic and tactical. <clears throat> the first, with a much higher explosive power, targets uh, the adversary away from the war front and within its own territory. The second has a smaller explosive capacity and is designed to be used on battlefield. To counter America's overwhelming superiority in strategic nuclear weapons, China emphasizes the deterrent strategy, which aims at making the cost of America's fair use of them prohibitive, retaining the possibility of a retaliatory nuclear strike against U.S. major cities, Beijing imposes upon Washington the need to restrain itself in the first use of its vastly superior <coughs> nuclear arsenal. To such an end, China has developed highly mobile land-based and submarine-based nuclear ballistic missiles, which are extremely difficult to find and destroy, and therefore allow and hence allow for a retaliatory nuclear strike. China's DF-41 and GL-3 intercontinental ballistic missiles are a good example of this. On the other hand, China's conventional ballistic missiles, which are a very important part a very important component of its asymmetric arsenal 
are capable to match the impact of America's tactical nuclear weapons. The DF-26 missiles are a good example of this. As a result, the US superiority in nuclear weapons may turn out to be to become more theoretical than effective. Five, the economic attitude. This relates to the capability of sustaining a higher GDP growth. China clearly surpasses the US in this field, <clears throat> uh, which doesn't require much explanation. In December 1978, uh, China's open door policy put in motion a historic process that has slid 800 million Chinese out of poverty. During those 41 years, China's GDP grew at an average rate of 10%. In uh, 2019, China's GDP grew 6.2%. However, China has embraced this slower economic growth, labeling it as the new normal. China's slowdown, slowdown though, has to be put in, into perspective. First, China's uh, growth of 6.2% in 2019, allow it to add to its GDP, the equivalent of the entire Australian economy, which is the world's 13th largest. Second, a magnitude of growth of around 6.5% should be sufficient to double China's GDP for the decade 2010-2020. Conversely, since the early 1970s, the US growth slipped on the 3% per annum, decelerating, decelerating further to under 2% since 2000. If so, and amid diverging growing curves, China should have become a much larger economy than the US in 2014. Based on several estimates, indeed, Robert Fordwell mentions that in 2040, in 2040, China's GDP could almost be three times as large as that of the US, with a 40% share of the global GDP versus a 14% for the US. Hence, this is an area very clear in itself and that doesn't require of more explanation. Six, the technological attitude. This refers to, the, to their capability to obtain primacy in a group of key emerging technologies. Well, thus, the US stand in relation to China. The answer admits no doubt. As number one, as the technological superpower whose commanding status China wants to reach and surpass. However, the gap between them is closing at amazing speed. An independent American task force admitted as much. In its words, and I quote, China is investing significant resources in developing new technologies. And after 2030, it will likely be the world's largest expenditure on research and development. China is closing the technological gap with the United States. And though it, might, it may not match US capabilities across the board, it will soon be a leading power in technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, fifth generation cellular networks, 
quantum technology and very possibly biotechnology. End of the quote. Indeed, while the US leads the world in research and development expenditures with 26% of the global total, China is in second place with 21%. However, since 2000, China's spending in research and development increased 18% annually, whereas the US one grew but only 4%. China and the US are in direct competition in several technological key areas, with both parties enjoying in, of particular advantages within this process. And although China cannot aspire as yet to overcome US technological superiority overall, the technologies in which they are competing have immense repercussion as each of them has a multiplier effect over many other technologies. As mentioned, those areas are artificial intelligence, fifth generation networks, superconductors, quantum information systems, space control, etc. At the end of the day, this struggle for technological supremacy is dependent on the efficiency of two very different technological development models, the state-guided and funded one and the market-oriented one. While China follows the first, the US follows the second. China has focused <coughs> state-led efforts and investments on ensuring that science, technology, and innovation propel the country as a fundamental growth engine. At the same time, the Chinese state has set ambitious targets in technological capability building in a range of specific uh, sectors. Meanwhile, it has stimulated uh, the private sector and venture capital efforts in this area, guiding them toward a set of strategic goals. More than that, targeted technological priorities defined by the states are getting directly both the energy and the funding from public to private and from the national level to the state and municipal ones. In other words, a multiplier effect concentrated in key areas. Meanwhile, the Chinese state directs a large percentage of its annual budget, budget towards education with science and technology being its main priority. The US has yet the leading technological superpower as a market-oriented approach to technology. The private sector on whose hand technology generation relies focuses solely on assessing the returns of any investments and if uh, the returns of any investments are high enough to justify the risks. This is the case of both high-tech companies when assessing new development projects and of venture capitalists when judging about the merits of investment, of investing in a, a startup. Moreover, private research and development has increasingly turned away from basic scientific research and focus on applied research. This means emphasizing commercially oriented product development at the expense of capital intensive long run research projects. Innovation as a consequence is becoming more incremental and less able to produce technological breakthrough. Curiously enough, the US technological system would not be what is it today at the state had the federal government not acted as a catalyst for development. 
This was the model that prevailed until a few decades ago, a period when breakthrough inventions paved the ground for what Silicon Valley is today. Silicon Valley would not have been possible without the capital intensive basic research and long run projects funded by the federal government. This became particularly true after the so-called Sputnik moment, the American shock resulting from the Soviet launching of the first ever satellite to orbit Earth by the Soviets. Uh, according to NASA's count, at least 2,000 products and or services were helped into development and commercialization as a result of the scientific research that took place during that period. Nowadays, the private sector has virtually become the sole force in guarding the US high tech fortress against China's formidable challenge. It is very much on its own amid an inquisitive and regulatory framework laid by the federal government. While the threat of dismemberment and increased regulation hangs in the air for the most successful US technological companies, the government has been inauspicious in helping them access the foreign talent that they need and lack at home. The Chinese have become the best pupils in following the textbook of America's innovation success story in the decades that follow World War II. Although hampered by nationalistic overtones, the root map in science, technology, and innovation looks much more coherent and holistic than the one being followed in the US. Although the US still commands the technological heights, trends seem to be pointing towards China in a group of fundamental technologies as previously mentioned. Conclusions. After comparing the aforementioned six aptitudes, it is possible to have a better understanding of the power correlation between both countries. China stands better than the US in relation to the convergence and the strategic aptitudes. Conversely, the United States is much better prepared in relation to the universality aptitude. On the other hand, although the US still prevails, prevails in the military, economic and technological aptitudes, reverse trends in motion move in China's direction. All of the above leads to conclude that although China may have brought unto itself many unnecessary problems by challenging the US too openly, it did not act prematurely. In other words, at this point in time, the United States does not seem to have the capability to revert China's ascendancy in any meaningful way. Moreover, by openly, China, by openly challenging the US, China strengthens the nationalistic resolve of its population, providing a boost and a clear sense of direction for the attainment of those strategies. It is thus possible that, uh, that after assessing costs and benefits, the Chinese Communist Party may have concluded that the benefits of acting openly and decisively outweighed the cost, outweighed the cost of challenging the US. At this point, the question to be asked uh, what uh, are the options that can result from the clash of these two giants? 
have an ascertain how well China and the U.S. rank in their respective comprehensive national status, it becomes possible to envisage which could be the options involved. According to my book, those options will be five. America's containment, containment of China, power sharing between the two of them, war, America's withdrawal, and the collapse of the Chinese Communist Party regime. Let, her, let us very briefly review those five scenarios. The first possibility involved would be the long-term containment of China by the US. This follows the main lines that America put in motion in relation to the Soviet Union between 1947 and 1991. However, during the Cold War, neither the First Cold War, neither the Americans nor the Soviets challenge each other main spheres of influence, essentially limiting their confrontation to client states in peripheral zones. This is certainly not the case in the current situation between China and the US, where Taiwan is involved. The second option would be a far sharing agreement. This would be the kind of compromise advocated by figures such as Henry Kissinger and Paul Kennedy. But would China be willing to accept a power sharing agreement in its historical sphere of influence? Or conversely, would the US be prepared to, to treat China as an equal? The third option would be war. If that is the case, what kind of war might this be? Would it be a two-seated strap situation whereby the leading power triggers war before it is too late to win it? Or conversely, would it be a power transition theory type of conflict where it is the emerging power, the one more prone to trigger, to trigger a war? Would uh, there be a line involved? Would this be a short conflict, a conflict or the kind of long conflict that prevails when a new part distribution is involved? The fourth option may be America's withdrawal. Uh, it must not be forgotten that US foreign policy has been has shown to possess its own very particular yin and yang qualities, meaning seemingly opposing forces that actually belong to the same oneness. This oneness being the United States serves perceived moral superiority and the yin and yang represented the shifting periods of international missionary impulse and isolations. But would America be ready to yield the superpower status that withdrawal entails? The fifth option would be the collapse of the Chinese Communist regime. Would the regime be able to overcome the economic and social challenges that it is currently facing while simultaneously confronting the US and riding the tiger of domestic nationalism? If not, collapse might ensue. But is this the case? BSAP, the future will not be easy. According to my book, what makes the competition between the US and China so, so utterly complex is the fact that both countries perceive themselves as pinnacles within human history. Finding themselves at close purposes, the Middle Kingdom and the exceptional nation are not an easy way out as they are both prisoners of their history 
and the national myth. Uh, neither of them can objectively look at the future without distorting their analysis by the subjective lenses of the perceived sense of superiority or mission. Well, a civilization state with millennia of glorious past entitled to the leading role America's field challenge in a self-perceived providential entitlement to be a beacon for humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I pass the floor to you now. Thank you, sir. For those interesting arguments and observations about such a complex issue, these, all these arguments, I'm sure, are very relevant for scholars of international relations and all other social sciences who have joined us, for, joined us today. I think it was a significant lecture that has raised many concerns about the power dynamics in international politics. We will now have a discussion where first the panelists will share their observations, which will be followed by the question answer round. I invite Professor Muhammad Mazam Ali Mustarib, former HOD. Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad, to share his views and comments about the arguments presented by the ambassador. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ariba. Thank you very much. It was indeed a very informative and very good uh, lecture. Uh, the, the fact cited by uh, uh, Professor Alfred Toro Hardy are impressively organized and he's, he has made his point very forcefully by putting them all together very effectively. Uh, what all I have to say in this regard is uh, I'll make an observation which contains question or questions, which if you choose to answer, can answer. But mine is an observation on the theme, on the theme of the book. The first point that come to my, comes to my mind is, and God forbid, does it mean, mean that prevalence of either China or the United States will be decided by a nuclear war, a nuclear showdown. God forbid, if that happens, there are no in a nuclear war, as you know, there are no victors and vanquished. We all would be uh, killed. Now, one thing that is to be added to what the professor has to say is the human costs internal human costs, and also in case of war, what would be the human costs? Supposing he might mention 150 missiles, deadly missiles China has, but each missile can kill, say, thousands of people. He should also make a calculation as to if uh, those 150 missiles are effectively used, how many million people would be killed? Secondly, the question of poverty within China and the United States. It's a very wrong notion that America has no poverty. America has a lot of poverty. So has China. China rural, rural areas are, they look like a very poor country, actually. So uh, this is another point to be uh, noted about this. The, the third thing is, all this is about maintaining American hegemony. America wants to maintain its hegemony and therefore they are concerned about whatever China is doing. As far as uh, a general scholar is concerned, he looks around and finds that everyone is strengthening defenses. American defense expenditure is uh, more than defense expenditure of all the countries put together. Who is not building up? India is doing it. Rafale aircraft are bought from France very recently. India is the largest purchaser of arms uh, in the world. Uh, Russia is coming up with new generation of weapons and missiles and so on. And so forth. 
and the aircrafts are the best in the world. China is doing, as Professor has already pointed out, China is also doing the same. Turkey is doing the same. Which country can you pinpoint which is not, even North Korea, which is not uh, strengthening its so-called security and defense forces? When a country can feel secure is a very big question that also we, uh, to be tackled. When are you secure? When you surround yourself with friendly countries or when you have total hegemony or conditions and so on. So it should also be noted, when do you feel secure? Security minimum or maximum or satisfying at all? So this is another question. So all the countries are actually Yeah, now coming to uh, some some points slipped my mind because when I wrote in handwriting, it was difficult to read. I could not fully type this out, so I'm consulting it. Now, the, 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 the point uh, to be made is about the United States. Who is actually indulging in the acts of provocation? It is the United Nations, United States. If it is it, a question of Guam or Taiwan or South China Sea or elsewhere in the world. America is testing China's power, causing provocation to China. Chinese are not doing that. America wants global hegemony. China doesn't want it. For China, world is Southeast Asia, it's a backyard. They don't have larger designs on other parts of the world. This has been throughout history, true. When the English ambassador in the ancient times came to China to seek an appointment with the emperor, he was made to wait for a week. And after which he was given appointment, the emperor's first question was, who are you? He said, I'm an Englishman. Which country you come from? I come from England. Where is it? It's seven seas afar. Why have you come here? Sir, we want to establish trade relations. Answer was, whatever China needs is produced within the country. We don't need trade with you. Uh, and so on. The set of questions that the emperor asked shows that China's view of the world is not sort of all inclusive and extends to all parts of the world. They are interested in Southeast Asia and they still are interested in Southeast Asia. Americans and Muslims, these are the two people who have had world hegemony for spells of time. Uh, and so, so England, uh, when I say America, I include Europe also. Together, they have had this experience of hegemony. And China did not have this kind of a hegemonic view of the world. So their ambitions are limited. Uh, then uh, I would say, okay, if this ultimately boils down to American hegemony, Americans decided after the Cold War that they would not allow any power to emerge which can contest the US power. Amazingly, they include this in their documents that they would not allow emergence of any power which can contest the United States which by itself is a very, uh, very disturbing thing. And as far as the human costs are concerned, this also should be brought into question. China has reached a stage at what cost? Such massive violations of human rights. Even now it's the most tragically human rights hostile country in the world. And these costs are very necessary to point out. China and the United States, poverty in China, poverty in the United States, human rights violations in the quality of life in these two countries. These are also areas that need to be investigated along with the powerful weapons and all those things. <clears throat> weapons can only kill nuclear weapons also. In India and Pakistan, people danced on the streets uh, in 1998 after Pohran explosions. Then now they are about dancing for what? Bomb can only kill. And that is why Khrushchev gave that argument of 
nuclear war, there is no victor or vanquish, and therefore there should be peaceful coexistence of different systems. So all these aspects need to be highlighted uh, along with uh, who will prevail. But if ultimately the question is that there should be a nuclear showdown between China and the United States to, to establish who will prevail, nobody will prevail. Both the countries will be destroyed and it becomes an empty question, meaningless question, who prevails? And why should you prevail? This is a typical Western psychology. If you are building up your arms, you necessarily are in contest with somebody. Americans cannot live without enemies. They have to have enemies. So uh, uh, they found uh, Russia and then after the Muslim world and now they are concentrating on China as, as the enemy. Why can't they coexist? They can. The possibilities uh, of human touch to these analyses to be, are to be explored, I, I think. Although, sir, I, I would not say that I have read your book very carefully, but these are theme-related comments that I'm making, and I hope uh, they might be of use. Thank you very much, Aibo. Thank you so much. Uh, Ariba, please mute, unmute yourself. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, sir, for those insightful comments. I now request the ambassador to respond to his analysis and questions if he so desires. Well, I agree that there can be no picture in a nuclear war. And again, I don't think a nuclear war uh, would be the answer, nor that there is an important probability of one ensuing, because as I mentioned, uh, the deterrent capability that China has is sufficient to maintain a situation in which the US, who has a larger, a much more larger amount of nuclear weapons, will not make a first use of them for obvious reasons. Uh, so essentially, I think, as I mentioned as well, that the underpinning element of this new contest is efficiency, meaning the capability shown by both countries, by the respective models, of being more effective in providing results whereas we're talking of economic results, whereas we are talking of technological results, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, I think that uh, this is not the best option for the US. While the competition with the Soviet Union during the First World War was based essentially in ideology, was posed essentially in ideological terms. This one, again, is posed in efficiency terms. And while the US was particularly well prepared in, to wage a cold war in, in, in ideological terms, because it's the oldest democracy in the modern world, because uh, it has always presented itself as a beacon for the rest of humanity, et cetera, et cetera. It is very bad prepared for a competition in terms of results. We have just seen how the US botched its response to the COVID-19 crisis with just 4% of uh, the human population, it has provided 20% of the death of the pandemic. And um, the US has become a fractious society, a highly polarized society, unable to provide the necessary results in a confrontation with a country as China that in the last 40 years have lifted 800 million people from poverty has become a competing leading economic superpower 
and referring to the, to the COVID-19 crisis, has been able to provide the kind of response that small countries such as Singapore or Denmark has provided. Notwithstanding the fact that Singapore or Denmark have 6 million inhabitants, whereas China has almost 1.4 billion inhabitants. So if the competition is based in, efficiently, in efficiency terms, the US is in real problem. Thank you, sir. I now invite our second panelist, Dr. Bhim Subha, who has recently joined the Department of Political Science at the University of Hyderabad to share his observations and analysis. Over to you, sir. Mm, uh, can, am I audible? Yes, sir. OK, uh, good evening, uh, Professor Mozumali. And it's, uh, I've heard about you a lot, but I've never met you in person, but definitely. Uh, thank you for the invite uh, to the AIRS and as well as Dr. Ariba, uh, sorry, Ms. Ariba here, Devendra and everyone for inviting me. And firstly, I would like to uh, thank and congratulate uh, Ambassador Professor uh, Hardy here for one of his uh, very important work. And my, uh, to come, actually, my studies are China, is definitely China studies. I do comparative politics, but I've been trained in, in Sinology and on China. And uh, I would uh, my intervention would uh, with would be with regard to your uh, as Professor Mozamali already uh, pointed out uh, the theme of the book itself like it is very very provocative. Uh, it remembers me when I was reviewing a book on by Martin Jakes uh, like in two thousand eight or nine when he came out with a book called uh, uh, When China Rules the World and End of the Western World and the Birth of New Global. Uh, order. That was a very provocative book during that time. And uh, that actually really helped and, you know, really uh, shaped many of uh, the young China scholars, both in South Asia and many of the parts of the world, and as well as uh, try to engage China in a different perspective. And um, just to come uh, to some of the themes that I have really looked at uh, your book, especially I haven't looked at the book itself, but I've read some of the chapters which were made available by the World Scientific Publisher. And, and also looking into some of the themes of the chapters that, uh, so uh, I, I, uh, I tend to find that some of the chapters are trying to, uh, you know, you're, uh, are trying to make an argument that US is really uh, in a losing side. So is it like a very, uh, you know, are you still in that, uh, uh, you know, thinking process? Because now since uh, the next week we have Trump, you know, elections in the United States, how would you see that? Like after publication of your book in August, 2020, and now how do you, how do you see that? Because there are some uh, statements about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, US withdrawal from the uh, from Asia, Asian theater, and uh, the collapse of Soviet, uh, sorry, the uh, Communist Party of China. Do you really foresee this kind of situation emerging in China, especially under the current regime uh, of Xi Jinping? And also, uh, some of the queries that I really uh, uh, wanted, uh, you know, like definitely, uh, if I had more opportunity, you know, time, and you know, if I, uh, you know, received a book and read it, I would have been more constructive in, 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 in your assessment. However, like uh, I agree definitely to many of your you know, research with regard to uh, China's improving or uh, improving and uh, you know, increasing uh, world status in the global uh, uh, you know, decision-making process also at the, at the table also, because with regard to like technology, one of the papers that you wrote for global labor organizations, if I can remember, I was reading that and that really said how technological shift in China has really happened and emerged. And if you really see the patents filed by the Chinese today, you, uh, it has really, you know, dwarfed many of the countries. And today United States is number two in filing patents. Uh, if you see the 2019 census, uh, 
sorry, the data that uh, the world international or uh, international intellectual property organizations have really uh, given us. And also now, how do you see uh, my, my, my question would be, uh, it would be uh, rather, uh, how would, uh, you know, your assessment after publication of this book and how do you see the future uh, assessment about China's policy vis-a-vis -vis America? Because I hope today uh, they are not as happy with the Trump presidency and uh, what would that happen and what would that, you know, what would be your prognosis uh, for the future? And one of the uh, assessment that you said that China tries to see uh, itself as a civilizational state and U.S. as a hegemonic power. So is it, is it, is, is China following the U.S. exceptionalism? Uh, because even U.S. tends to have this, uh, you know, mindset or whether it's within the state, uh, it's statecraft that U.S. exceptionalism and the Chinese civilization and state exceptionalism, does it run, par run parallel to each other? And also, I think um, uh, I will stop here, but definitely this book would be a very, very good book for many of the political, you know, students of political science, and as well as both at the graduate and undergraduate levels, and many of the diplomats also. I think uh, for it, it would be a great service to our many of our foreign service aspirants also for the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If so, uh, uh, Ambassador Alfredo, sir, would like to respond to him. Yes, of course. Very interesting questions, uh, Professor Suga. Uh, the first one is if the US is in the losing side of this uh, correlation of this uh, contest. Well, as I mentioned in the book, uh, there are five aptitudes that have been measured. Within those five, aptitudes, the uh, China clearly prevails in two, the US clearly prevails in one, and in, uh, in, in, in the other two, uh, even though if uh, the US still prevails, trends move in China's direction. So at the end of the day, I think that time is running on China's behalf. As for question number two, what will result from the election, from the US election? I don't think that uh, there will be um, much change in relation to China. I think the Cold War, the conflict between these two countries is not conjunctural. It has become a structural. It is closely related to the fact that the US feels challenged in its entitlement to leadership, to global leadership. And hence, I don't think that the Biden administration which, uh, would change the course. Uh, of most probably, or most certainly, the reality show approach that President Trump has shown will certainly disappear, and we will be faced with a much more consistent and serious foreign policy by the part of the, of the United States. But having said that, uh, the essence of the conflict will remain in place. In more general terms, what may change from the US election? I don't think much will change neither. The US has become a fractured society. It's, as I was mentioning, is horizontally fractured by two big majorities in which and two irreconcilable, uh, two, two, con two majorities that demonize themselves, demonize each other. And uh, um, the result will be 
a divided country, an increasingly dysfunctional country, and a country that will find many problems in maintaining the current superpower status that now has. As for the third question, the technological uh, will the US withdraw? Uh, this was one of the options that I mentioned in the book as well. It's not the only option that can result, but this could be one of the options. And again, as I was mentioning before, the US has always had a sense of moral superiority, a sense of entitlement to leadership coming from this kind of uh, providential entitlement uh, that they assume they had. And uh, well, uh, this providential entitlement has two shifting elements. At times, it leads to a missionary policy in which they feel that they have to indoctrinate the rest of the world as to the values and the virtues of, the demo of their democracy and, and their way of life. And some periods in which they feel that they had to uh, look into themselves, isolationist periods in which they had to retrench into themselves because the world has become too, com too, too uh, unworthy of them, uh, to put it in a very simple way. Hence, this dual capacity of missionary aptitude or isolationist aptitude deriving from their self-perceived sense of moral entitlement can lead them to withdraw, to withdraw from, from the global leadership. Uh, then there is the technological competition. Uh, as I mentioned as well, the two parties are competing and whereas the US will have a overall superiority in, in technology for many years to come, China will probably acquire superiority in a group of key areas. In any case, the two countries are competing for a group of key technology with a high multiplier effect. And in those areas, uh, China has a very good opportunity in prevailing in some, in some of them, such as 5G technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc., which by themselves are fundamental new technologies. As for the prognosis of uh, the China's following US exceptionalism, I think that kind of exceptionalism has always existed in China's mentality. They have always considered themselves to be the middle kingdom, meaning uh, being an intermediate position between the heavens and the rest of the of 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 the of the peoples and civilization on earth they have always considered to be a pinnacle within human civilization they have always considered to be uh, the, the 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 most developed civilization on earth hence they have always felt to be an exceptional nation and it's this clash of exceptionalism, which makes this current situation so complex, because neither of them, neither the US or China, will be ready to accept the uh, to deal in terms of the primacy of their own values, of their own self-perceived national myth.
Thank you, sir. And with this, I invite questions from the participants. The first question is from Narendra Kumar. He wants to know, sir, how do you think China would react to Mike Pompeo's recent visit to India and other Asian countries right before the presidential elections? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Could you repeat the question? Sure, sure, sir. He wants to know, how do you think China would react to Mike Pompeo's recent visit to India and other Asian countries right before the presidential elections, American presidential elections? Well, uh, I think um, China, the two plus two meeting between the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Ministers of Defense of both India and, uh, and, and, and the US has been very important. And I presume that uh, China must be very worried about this approach. But it's not only the two plus two meeting. On the other hand, we have to remember that India participated in the Quad meeting held in, the, in, in Tokyo recently, and that India as well was a participated within the Five Eyes uh, grouping in Tokyo as well. Uh, which is an intelligence sharing agreement between the US, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, and Canada. Hence, uh, I presume that China must be worried about uh, this approachment of China to the United States. And uh, of course, what will come next have to be seen. Thank you, sir. Dr. Om Prakash Upadhyay wants to know if you see China becoming a superpower in the near future and a Cold War beginning between USA and China. I think China is already a superpower and I think we are witnessing already a Cold War between the two of them. So it's not a matter of the future. I think we are very much into that present. <laughs> okay, sir. Now, Kudratullah Faraz wants to know if is it possible that the conflict between USA and China will take a form of proxy war between their allies, perhaps an Indo-Pakistan war with India backed by the US and Pakistan backed by China? I would very much doubt so, because that's very much the difference between the, the the, the first Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union and the current Cold War between China and the US. During the first Cold War, uh, Stalin, uh, very early on within the, this Cold War, the first Cold War, Stalin realized that it could not have further advancement in, in Europe beyond the Iron Curtain. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it began to develop its uh, expansionism in other areas of the world. As a result, confrontations between the US and the UK and, and, and the Soviet Union took place in peripheral nations uh, and, and, and not in, in, in the main areas. Uh, in this case, not that, that India could never be considered a peripheral nation, let me add, uh, India, it's a huge, uh, it's, it's a huge part. But in any case, uh, in the current Cold War between China and the US, what, what is at stake are areas which are fundamental for, for China, such as Taiwan, such as the South China Sea. So the nature of this new Cold War is taking place not in faraway countries, but in central areas of fundamental importance for China. Hence, this is a totally different Cold War 
And this is precisely the element that makes this new Cold War so dangerous in relation to the previous one. Thank you, sir. Harsh Chauhan wants to know if USA is trying to make India a buffer zone between China and the US. I don't think it's trying to make, a, I would say that in any case, during the Trump administration, what we have seen is the opposite, at least during the Trump administration. Trump has had a transactional approach to foreign policy and particularly to its, for, to its uh, relations with India. Instead of seeing India, as a fundamental geopolitical player in the Indo-Pacific area, it has prioritized trade elements in its relations with India. Hence, it uh, has not given the proper importance that, uh, that, that, that India deserves in geopolitical terms. Just lately, and you just mentioned, we have seen these uh, few uh, new elements like the two plus two meeting in New Delhi and the meetings that took place in Tokyo uh, in which India participated. But this is very lately at the end of the Trump period. Thank you, sir. There's a la our last question for the day. Farhat Nazima wants to know, will there be a World War III because of South China Sea? Let's hope not. But the fact again is that this is not a peripheral area for China. It's a fundamental area for China. It's an area that for millennia has been part of uh, China's uh, zone of influence. On the other hand, it's a, tribut a historical tributary area for China. So it's, we cannot uh, expect that China is ready to play a subsidiary role in its historical zone of influence. Uh, on the other hand, we have Taiwan involved and uh, Taiwan, it's considered to be a fundamental part of China, the great unification, it's one of the, leading nationalistic uh, objectives of China, and hence China would not renounce to that. Hence, uh, the possibility of a World War uh, III, if the US pushes too much, I'm afraid that uh, could happen. Thank you, sir, for patiently answering all the questions. And now request Rajesh Kumar, Assistant Professor at the Department of English, School of Language, Literature and Society from Jaipur National University to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ariba. I would like to begin by thanking Ambassador Alfredo Toro Hardy for joining us from Canada and taking time out, out from his busy schedule. Thank you, sir. I would also like to take this opportunity to take uh, to Thank Professor Modam, Modam Ali for joining us and asking pertinent questions and making the observations. I would also like to thank Dr. Beam Suba for bringing fresh perspective to today's discussion. And the participation of uh, all the participants, it could, not, it, not, it could not have been possible without their participation that this lecture could have been done. So thank, so thank you all of them as well. I would like to extend my thanks to the president of AIRS, Ariba Asnath Mozam, for her tireless efforts, which have made this event possible. I would like to thank uh, all the members who, are, who have been supporting, uh, including uh, Narendra Jarwal, Farizuddin Ali Mozam, Jaiba Mozam, Astabi, and Evangeline Nongklao for their timely help with, the, with making this lecture a success. Thank you all, and back to you, Ariba. Thank you, Rajesh. And with this, I conclude the event.
On a lighter note, when the New Delhi Journal Global Dialogue Review got to know that we are hosting the esteemed ambassador today, they reached out to us to request us to mention their new endeavor of bringing their journal Global Dialogue Review in the digital form, which is a quarterly journal. They would like to spread the word among Indian scholars for their journal subscription, of which the ambassador is also part of. I would once again like the ambassador, Alfredo Toro Hadi, sir, Professor Mohammad Mozam Ali Mustari, Dr. Bhim Subba, and all the participants for making this event a success. I hope to see all of you in our next lecture by the Dean of School of Social Sciences, University of Hyderabad, Professor Arun Kumar Patnaik, on understanding Gramsci's political thought, which is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you and good night. Bonsoir and au revoir. Thank you.